Welcome to Season 4 of E-Commerce Fastlane. This podcast helps resilient entrepreneurs thrive with Shopify. And now, on to Episode 144. You're listening to E-Commerce Fastlane, the podcast show to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Listen to real conversations with partners and subject matter experts as they share proven practical strategies, platforms, and the best Shopify apps to help you accelerate your business. The time is now for you to improve efficiencies, grow revenue, profit, and lifetime customer loyalty. Please welcome your host, startup founder and strategic advisor, Steve Hutt. This episode is brought to you by Yachtpo SMS Bump, the leading SMS marketing solution for Shopify brands that are looking to build a top revenue channel. Delivering unbeatable conversions and click-through rates, SMS Bump will help your brand cut through the noise and boost sales. With SMS Bump, you can build powerful remarketing automations to recover abandoned carts or even reactivate customers who haven't shopped in a while. Special thanks to Advanced Segmentation Filters, you can create truly personalized campaigns that will speak to each and every one of your customers, bringing in over 25x ROI. You can engage in one-on-one conversations with customers and give them the personalized experiences and tailored support they crave. What's also great about SMS Bump is their integration with key partners such as Zendesk, Klaviyo, Just Uno, and many more, including Yachtpo's other solutions. Your audience can enjoy an always-on, omni-channel experience on the channel they prefer. It's incredibly easy to download SMS Bump for free and set it up in less than five minutes. This is the only text marketing app you will ever need for your Shopify brand. And now, as an e-commerce fast lane listener, you get a one-month free trial on their paid plan. So check them out today. Click the link in the show notes, visit the Shopify app store, or ecommercefastlane.com forward slash SMS bump and see why over 90,000 other brands choose SMS bump. Well, hey there, it's Steve, and welcome back to the e-commerce fast lane podcast. Now, if this is your first time listening, this is an e-commerce show where we have honest and transparent conversations about building and thriving with your store powered by Shopify or Shopify Plus. New episodes are available twice weekly with your favorite podcast player like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and many more. You can also stream current episodes, including a very relevant back catalog directly from ecommercefastlane.com. Now, in today's episode, my guest is Grayson LaFrenz, who's the founder and CEO of a company called Power Digital Marketing. And they're a digital marketing agency that helps brands scale and increase their lifetime value. My prior conversations when I learned about Power Digital was through The Honest Company, a brand that I currently manage. They mentioned that they were using Power Digital uh, for a lot of their efforts, including SEO and other things. I believe they are or currently were uh, a partner, which we'll probably dig into a little later. But nice thing about this episode today is that we're going to learn a lot about how their platform, and they have a lot of pieces of the puzzle, and they do a lot of things from paid to social, and they do a lot of creative. There's PR and SEO and email. They really are a full funnel, full service agency, but they also have a really unique, and they've been on a, a, a recent merger and acquisition tear too, which we'll talk about in a few minutes also, uh, with some amazing first party tool, uh, that something that you may want to consider. Um, and also some of the things that I really think are exciting right now is the fact that the market is changing and only owning the full customer journey and maybe outsourcing a little bit of your marketing to a partner might make a lot more sense than trying to learn because it's so diverse right now and so complex. It can be challenging to wear hats on everything marketing strategy, where I'm sure we're going to learn today through Grayson that there is some opportunity to learn some of it and execute the best you can. But then at some point when you're really looking to grow and scale, that it's now is the time to kind of consider moving some of of your marketing efforts over to a third party like uh, Grayson's company. So, hi Grayson, uh, welcome to e-commerce Fastlane. Thanks, Steve. Excited to chat with you, and uh, couldn't be more movement and uh, exciting news and things happening in our industry. So, uh, 
a good time for us to be talking. It is wild. It's a it's an absolute wild time. I just got off another recording a few minutes ago, and we were chatting about the fact that one of the downfalls of one brand that I managed was the fact that prior to COVID, which I'm sure we're going to bring up the pandemic at some point in this conversation, but prior to that, 80% of their revenue was actually wholesale. We're talking mountain equipment co-op, all these kind of large retailers that were closed and then they decided to not open or were just selling through what they had because foot traffic was quite low. And what's interesting is that I kept pushing hard for this brand and a few others to say, listen, you have to own the customer journey. You have to figure out a way of having a better direct-to-consumer offer because you wouldn't be in this predicament right now if you, all your eggs were in the wholesale basket. Great to have this, you know, a wide view of the whole entire market, but then look what happened. Whereas we would own the customer journey completely and mean still do wholesale business, but really putting a lot of energy in your direct to consumer side, this wouldn't be as painful as what you're feeling now. Slowly, they've actually started to migrate over to this and now they really completely own the journey, but it was <laughs> challenging. A lot of brands aren't resilient and they just you know, didn't know what to do and they're just kind of frozen. And so that's what I'm hoping today to hopefully we can open the kimono a bit and say like, what do you see um, and what's happening in the marketplace? And I just, I want once and for all, because you deal with a lot of kind of mid and large brands, you have a good pulse of what's happening in the industry. So let's talk first on a high level. So people kind of set the stage a bit about power digital. What do you do? And which I know is a lot of things. And what sort of problems are you solving for Shopify brands? Yeah, great question. I mean, in a nutshell, Power Digital was created to help brands scale revenue and increase profit. And so usually when we're coming in, it's for one of those two reasons, but typically it's a hybrid of both where they've hit a bit of a glass ceiling and are looking for more top line growth, but then have to do it in a sustainable, profitable fashion that makes business sense. And so that's really uh, the problem that we're solving. And what the inspiration was to start Power Digital was, you know, myself as an entrepreneur, I'd hired a bunch of different agencies in my companies over the years. And what I would get was a lot of kind of fluffy strategy. And at the time, being a pretty scrappy entrepreneur, I had a lot of ideas, a lot of strategy. Not that we didn't want more, but what we really needed was help to execute at a very high level and then iterate on those plans. And I just could not find that. And it was a huge frustration I had. And what I what I found was that that was a frustration that a lot of brands had at different stages of the growth cycle. So we do that through pretty much all the digital trafficking channels. And so our team, we have about 320 team members. They're broken into very specific departments. So our Facebook advertising team only runs Facebook ads. Our uh, performance creative team only does performance creative. SEO only does SEO. Email only email. So they have very deep channel expertise, but then we build a custom team around the brand to help bring strategy and execution on a really deep and data-driven level. And so kind of in a nutshell, we help brands scale, grow revenue, get more profitable. And we do that through traffic, a lot of conversion rate optimization. And then also we do a lot on the retention side to drive lifetime value and make sure that we're acquiring the right customers that are the most valuable to the business and are gonna have the highest you know, repeat purchase rate and go forward value. This is fantastic because this is what I deal with all day long in Shopify. When I have a book of business, I have some, you know, quite a few brands that I manage and a lot of these topics come up. And like I said, at the top of the show, I find a lot of brands uh, tend to be involved in a lot of different communities and lots of learning and they try to hire different people and or they learn it themselves. Um, but I find that as you talk about channel expertise, I think it's super, super important to be able to, if you really want to execute correctly and you really want to make sure that you're actually driving growth, it's pretty challenging to want to dig into just with all the changes that are happening. I know we're going to bring up the iOS 14 in a few minutes too. I think this first party data problem in the cookie world, it's so interesting what's happening today. I think that's just another case in point of that, you know, there are agencies like yourself out there that really have channel expertise and can really help full funnel, both from top of funnel all the way through to the retention side of it. So I think it's super key. So let's talk about the journey because I'm, I'm always fascinated why people build companies and what specifically, because it's not more than just, I want to make money. I think you have a much larger idea around this. Uh, I've listened to a couple other podcasts, seen you on a few videos. So I understand your journey a little better than maybe most today, but let's share what uniquely 
you believe uniquely positions you and the founding team, I guess on a couple points, number one, to have the desire and number two, to have the expertise to even want to create this marketing agency? Yeah, great question. So, you know, my journey started in uh, 2007. I graduated college and I'd been exposed to entrepreneurship and I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I actually had a what I think was a pretty great idea at the time to start an online prep course to tackle the problem of a lot of uh, college students that failed out or they changed what they wanted to do and ended up wasting a lot of money or racking up a lot of debt. But it was kind of funny because I went to uh, try to raise some money for this venture in 2007 as a 22 year old uh, fresh out of college. And I got networked around and I was aggressive and I was hustling and I was getting a lot of no's and then finally got hooked up with this really successful entrepreneur that was actually a friend of my uncle. And he told me, uh, Grayson, you're ambitious, but you don't know anything. You have no skill set. And it's 2007, dude. No one's going to invest in you. He told me I needed to get a superpower or a skill set. And I asked him what the best one was if I wanted to be an entrepreneur, again, at a 22-year-old age. And he told me to learn how to be a rainmaker. And back in 2007, that was more you know, sales. And I think in today's world, it could be sales or digital marketing because of this collision course between sales and marketing. And so that's what I did. And I was lucky and uh, went and worked at Xerox, the only job that I've ever had for three years right out of college till I was about 25. And then I ventured uh, off and started my first business. And it was a SaaS company, long story short, unsuccessful, started another SaaS business in the event advertising space. I'd say that was moderately successful, but Really, I was flying into the headwind in that these publishers were getting beat up and that industry was really changing. And so it was just very difficult. And along the journey, ended up starting uh, this manufacturing business. And that's where I really got introduced to e-com. And e-com was a huge growth engine, learned digital marketing, learned how to manage and recruit and uh, build a great team. The company really took off. And then got into a a big lawsuit that I like to think taught me a lot about the legal system. And it was up against a billionaire. So billionaire versus little uh, little guy type of story went on for about a year. We ended up uh, having an outcome to where we, we didn't necessarily lose, but it made it very difficult to do business. And so I was in this holding pattern and I started to do Internet marketing for some entrepreneurs and friends. And I had two partners, my cousin. Nick, who uh, had worked in the agency world, I had never worked in the agency world. And then uh, my college roommate, Robert, who I'd started the other companies with. And so that's how Power Digital really started. And that was in 2012. And it's been just a super fun journey for me as an entrepreneur. The agency world is awesome because you get a new shiny toy every single week and you get to see a lot of sets of data and you get to see a lot of different uh, companies that have different models and, and problems that they need to solve and are at different phases in the in the life cycle. And so it's been an amazing journey and learning experience. But I think uh, the biggest reason why we've been successful, the biggest two reasons is number one, I don't come from an agency background. We do things differently. And the agency world is totally broken. And most of the agencies that are out there won't be there in, in five, 10 years. And I think our industry has gotten a bad reputation because of a lot of these kind of bad actors and bad players. And so we've never followed the agency model. We've always done it our way with technology, what makes sense to us. We've always put our people first. And uh, in doing so, our clients went in a big way. And then second is that we've been able to build a pretty special team, uh, scaling from three people to 320 people now. And we have had a 95% employee retention rate, which for our industry is really world class. So we've been able to attract great people, empower them and coach them up and keep them for a long time. And really our culture is that of a growth mindset. So everyone's getting better week in and week out. And it makes it a lot easier to win and succeed when you've got stability in that regard and a group of people that's really focused around improvement and learning and uh, getting better day in and day out. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's nice to just to have context about kind of the leadership and kind of, well, how are you running this company? I love the fact that you put people first. I really feel that it's like any brand, but it really is the communication. It's like Shopify, for example. It's how I deal with my book of business represents Shopify. Even though, you know, Shopify has its own mission, I understand exactly how the company is run and I know how I should interact with the brands that I manage. And it sounds like exactly the same thing. You're empowering your employees to make good decisions quickly, but with channel expertise, I think that's fantastic. So 
let's dig into a little bit about the access to data that you have, because I know as a, an agency leader, you obviously, I, I see the logos on your homepage. I know, I mean, I have personally have a couple of brands that are using your solution and a couple of audits and things that are currently underway right now. You have some real fast growing mid to large brands that are on Shopify right now. And, you know, you have, I don't know, three or 400 some customers right now with some real-time data are you able to talk about i guess a couple things like what sort of characteristics have led to these brands uh, to grow and scale maybe versus other brands that are just either uh, declining or stagnating yeah it's a great question and you know one thing that i think most of us know and you kind of touched on it at the start of the show but bigger brands have a massive advantage and uh, the advantage that they have is, is brand equity. They typically have lots of organic search, which makes the economics work a lot easier when you look at the ROI equation of e -com. And there's already trust. And so it's conversions higher, things like that. And so for challenger brands or you know brands that are looking to really disrupt an industry, they've got the deck stacked against them to an extent. So it is different when looking at those two groups, but when looking at more of the challenger brands, there's definitely some elements that make it a lot easier to succeed and scale. And I'm gonna pretend like, you know, these brands are not just, you know, backed by hundreds of millions of dollars that they can just pump into the machine and they have to be a little scrappier and they have to find ways to get profitable. Because I think if, if that's the journey and that's the way that you build your business, you have a lot more options and typically you can hold on to a lot more control, a lot more equity and have a much better outcome over the long term and, and be truer to the mission that you're on. So some of those are recurring revenues first. You know, for me as both internet marketer, entrepreneur and investor, this is something I look at and I personally will never start a business again that doesn't have recurring revenue. Every time that I've failed as an entrepreneur, I didn't have recurring revenue. And every time I've succeeded, I've had it. I don't think it necessarily needs to just be like a subscription model, but at least some sort of consumable that requires a repeat purchase on a regular basis. And so that allows you to really understand that lifetime value. And it gives you a lot more room because typically for most e-commerce stores that we see, the economics of acquiring a customer the first time are not that exciting. You know, usually it can be break even or, or maybe you're making a few bucks on that first purchase. But where the profit really typically comes in is on the second, third, fourth. That's number one. And, you know, you could think about your product mix now. And if you don't have that, you know, think about adjacent products that you can establish or that you can build and expand your line that may give that to you. Second would be average order value over $75. So whenever we see an average order value under 75, and I'd say you could say it's 70 or 75 or 80, but right around there, it's just really hard to get the prospecting economics to work because you know, you've got the cost of traffic, then you've got your conversion rate, then you've got your average order value and whatever your gross profit is. And so what we found is that when that average order value is $75 or higher, that that engine works a lot better and you have a lot more room to make that formula work to your advantage. So if you don't have it now, there actually are a lot of uh, apps in the Shopify ecosystem that can allow you to you know, increase that journey that the customer has and get them to add additional product to the cart. There's also things that you can do on the sales side of things. Obviously, product development should be really tied in with marketing and your marketing data. So it's not like you're stuck if you don't have it, but that would be something that I, that I really look to and focus on when looking for brands that are gonna be able to profitably scale really quickly. And then uh, channel diversity would be another one. And so we see a lot of brands especially with some of our recent acquisitions that we've done and some of the customer base within those acquisitions, but they're just really dependent on one channel or two channels. And that to me is super scary. And usually you're gonna hit a glass ceiling when that's the case, or you're gonna be really vulnerable to competition or changes in that ecosystem. So that's a, another really important element. And then the last two that I would say are, I see so many entrepreneurs and founding teams that don't have that rainmaker. So they don't have somebody that is both passionate, so they love it, and has a superpower for acquiring customers or scaling revenue. And I think that's a really hard thing to outsource in entirety. So I think you can outsource 
you know, parts or partner on parts with people like us. But to really be successful, you need somebody on your team that is very vested and has their interests aligned with the organization fully that is going to own that and be kind of the throat to choke, for lack of a better analogy, on hitting those revenue goals. So those are kind of some of the key elements. The only other one that's a really nice to have is if you can happen to be in a space or design your product where you get that one to three impact. And so there's definitely certain brands that do this really well, but you know, how do you get word of mouth within your customer base? And how do you build the product to drive that? So that when you acquire one customer, you know, you're very likely gonna get another two or three because they're gonna, you know, tell their friends, their network about it, or they're proud to be using that product. And that makes the the math work a lot better when trying to build that engine that you can put a dollar into and get five, six, seven, eight dollars out of in terms of acquiring new customers. What really resonates with me based on what you've just been discussing is I think about life cycle marketing and being a very interesting hot topic for me lately. And I'm surprised how many brands, they have a cursory knowledge of it, but they're not digging deep enough in it, understanding your active and your at risk and your churned customers, and then how you're marketing to those cohorts of customers. I really think that a lot of times there's one purchase or two or they're loyal customers. And it's so interesting to me that people maybe have a, like I said, cursory knowledge, but they're not executing on it. And I think that's something that maybe your organization can really help people with because I think there is first party data in there that can really understand the data that's inside Shopify and how do we directly interact with this data? Because right now, like as we know, the landscape is massively changing right now. Uh, just number one, because of COVID, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. I know that there is, you know, vaccines coming and people are making some choices here and there. Slowly retail is opening. But at the end of the day, I think, you know, e-commerce adoption because of the pandemic, it's not going away anytime soon. Retail is definitely going to reopen uh, slowly over time, but people are still really used to it and are enjoying shopping online. So let's talk about kind of the trends, I guess, that you're kind of seeing and maybe how first party data might fit into a lot of this. I understand there's been an acquisition recently too, but let's talk about Google. Let's talk about Facebook and let's try to figure out what you see on your side now. Yeah, no, it's a great point. So one of the hottest things right now and biggest areas that we all in this industry need to be focused on is the big uh, changes that are coming to data protection and data access. And so you hear people talk about a cookie-less future. I don't think it's going to be fully cookie-less, but Facebook and our reps at Facebook and Google have made it incredibly clear that there's going to be huge limitations to third-party data and to how we pixel customers. And so the uh, biggest buzz at Facebook's for the year is really around that and their conversion API. And the conversion API is to help solve for that. But you know, really the, the net takeaway for businesses is, is that your first party data is gonna be more valuable than ever. And that's what's really gonna be driving you know, how you target, how you acquire the right customers and Retargeting is going to be limited in a big way in the future through all platforms. So, you know, luckily for us, I'd say luckily, I think there is obviously some strategy and thought too. But uh, last year we acquired a platform that is a Shopify app and it's called DataQ. And I know that you interviewed Andreas, who was the founder of that, I think uh, on episode 67, I believe it was. DataQ just does just that. So the biggest challenge that brands have with first party data is one, first of all, just collecting it and having enough customers to make it really actionable and a big enough data set. That part, most people can figure out. But two is how do you actually analyze it and create actionable insights? And most brands, even that are 100 million, 200 million, 300 million, they don't necessarily have huge data engineering teams. And so DataQ is basically a first party data analysis tool. And uh, we're going to give you a code and, and offer a year for free on DataQ to anybody listening. You can look it up in the Shopify app store. And I believe that the 12 the month free code is Fastlane is the uh, coupon code or whatever. But uh, basically what it does is exactly what you talked about. So you kind of one click ingests your Shopify data. It will slice and dice your lists and it will come back with a bunch of recipes that are really actionable and valuable. So for example, it'll show you your highest lifetime value clients and you can overlay 
append data on that and see customer insights. How do I get more of those customers? Where do they live? What are they all about? And how can I go make sure that when I'm acquiring customers, that it's not just, oh, great, we had a profitable customer acquisition, but that you're acquiring your customers that have the highest lifetime value because you're probably willing to pay quite a bit more for a lifetime value client of $2,000 than $200. So it does that. It also helps you uh, slice and dice and see stale customers that haven't purchased within periods of time and does that automatically. It will call out missed retention moments where new customers had not purchased within the, the typical threshold that you get your second purchase. So it does a bunch of these things, makes it actionable, and then integrates directly with your email platform, whether that's Klaviyo or whatever you're using, as well as Facebook's ad engine, Google ads, et cetera. And so this is gonna be really critical. Now, the one I think scary thing for a lot of the listeners here when it comes to these data changes is that when I look at it, less third-party data that you're gonna get in Facebook, Google, et cetera, and a bigger premium on your first-party data actually seems to me like a big competitive advantage for bigger brands, more established brands because they have tons of that data. And so that's kind of a scary thing. And that's why I think right now it's so critical for these challenger brands or these earlier phase brands to really put a big focus on this and have a clear strategy so that they're not kind of flat footed and having even bigger challenges to compete against these bigger players as these roll out in the months ahead. And, and they'll, they're going to begin to roll out here in April uh, is when we're going to begin to really see this impact. Yeah, I've always wondered the dates on that. And nice to be uh, close to the ground and to, to know uh, there's been so much content that's been produced and stuff, a lot of what ifs, because, you know, just no one knows when it's going to roll, but it's going to roll soon uh, with this iOS 14, even though iOS 14 is out, but just this particular update, this version is not live yet. And so I Definitely see the value of first party data. I have firsthand use of the data queue platform because you're right. I did interview Andreas prior to your acquisition and learned a lot about their platform. I just looked a moment ago and I have seven brands that are connected right now to data queue right now. And so it's interesting. It's a really interesting tool. And thank you so much for offering that to the listeners today. I'll make sure in the show notes that I put a link to the one year offer just literally connect your Facebook uh, account to it, um, your ads manager and connect Clavio if that's your uh, email platform of choice. Then from there, it'll really reveal and uncover a lot of things you never realized before. So it's hard to tell in a podcast what it actually does, but follow the links um, in the show notes and definitely add that as, as part of your arsenal and it's free of charge. And thank you for offering that. And so I want to make a little bit of a pivot over and I want to kind of retalk a bit about your mentioning about building teams and retaining and, and developing them because I think that's a big topic that I think education and just understanding what's going on in the industry to be a market leader, you have to be learning and innovating and willing to test. Uh, there's going to be some failures and just continue on and growing. And I know you personally have been recognized and I, I, I just I want to make sure people understand that, you know, you've been in Forbes, you've been in Entrepreneur Magazine, you know, there's a lot of things that you've done to really help. And I have firsthand knowledge because I work with some of your team members. Other than Shopify, they're the nicest people that I've ever worked with because they just want to be helpful. They want to contribute to others. And I really appreciate that whole mindset and that mantra that just want to help people and they know that they can make a difference and they know they can make impact. And so you obviously are doing something internally to help develop these employees or are able to share maybe some tips for those listening today that, you know, maybe a brand is building a team in house or like, how do you attract talent or any advice? Can you give any advice about how you can build a team that could be in house or how do you manage an external team? Yeah, no, it's a great point. It's super interesting because our business is incredibly fun when you've got an amazing client that treats you with respect and is part of their team. And it's not fun when you don't. But to me, this is one of the biggest misses that I think entrepreneurs have in general. And it's really common sense. And it's, you know, treat others the way that you would want to be treated. And that's the approach that that we've always taken. And I think, you know, we've done a lot of great things and then we've missed. Um, and I think when we miss, though, the great thing is that our team knows that our intentions are really good and that we're really working hard and trying to do the right things. And we own that, you know, when we, when something doesn't go our way or we put our team in an unfair situation, you know, 
I think just being uh, vulnerable with that and being real and uh, transparent is the key. And and I, you know, I know that that's a, a kind of core value of your podcast and it really hits home. And and so for us, a couple kind of easy tips. One is common sense, treating your team the way that you'd want to be treated. Number two is like, what do your team members care about? What is their true driver and motive? And what are they trying to accomplish in their career? Because I think that most of our team has bigger goals than what they're doing today. I know that. And so if I can help equip them with the skills and help them on their path towards that bigger goal, whether it's to be a CMO or a CEO or an entrepreneur, or just have amazing quality of life and and feel fulfilled in what they're doing. If I can help them on that journey, then it's a win-win. But a couple things that we've done that have worked really well, and I think that we're pretty entrepreneurial when it comes to our employee development programs. First of all, a couple of years ago, or maybe six years ago, I remember I was sitting on my couch at home over uh, winter break. We used to take a couple of weeks off for winter break in the very early days. And I was thinking because people like entrepreneurs I knew had told me, hey, uh, a lot of these young stars you have, they're going to leave just because that's what young people do. And I remember thinking it doesn't have to be that way. And I thought back to my own experience where I almost left Xerox for a total lateral move. Yeah, the pay was higher, but I didn't. And so I really thought about why I didn't do it. And I came up with this concept that we've done throughout our company called the Vital Five Goals. And so every team member in our company has them every year. And so the first one is, you know, what is your earnings goal that would be a blowout year? And the reason why we have that is that the way our compensation plans work is it really aligns the employee's comp with what drives our business forward and it's uncapped. And so they can make a lot of money in a lot of ways through that. And then the second goal, uh, Vital Five goal is, you know, what is your vision statement for your role in a year from now? So it really helps us understand, you know, do they want to get into management? Do they want to switch departments? Do they want to be more strategy behind the scenes or do they want to be more client facing? Do they want, are they interested in going into sales? What do they want to do and what are they driven towards? And then the third one is, you know, what are the one or two skill sets that you really want to master this year? And what I found is especially young people and millennials, myself being one, they want to grow. They're motivated by feeling like they're growing and learning and improving. And so the more that we know where their interests are, the more we can bring them those resources and assure that they get that experience and they learn. And then the fourth is their big personal goal to assure that they've got balance. And then the fifth is how they need management or leadership to show up to assure that they're really supported. So we track all of those. We keep score and track them quarterly. And, you know, if we can hit all five of those for a team member, why would they leave? They're earning what they want. Their role is progressing. They're learning. They're supported and they're empowered to to hit their personal goals. So that's kind of a common sense example that I think people can put their own spin on and do it their way, but has worked really well. And then we get creative. Like right now we're doing a Power Digital MBA. We've done it multiple times. We have a lot of team members that want to learn more broad business. It's also valuable to us. The future of our industry is being more than just a marketer or digital marketer, but really a business consultant that understands what executives care about, understands what drives value for businesses, et cetera. And so we put together this curriculum, and this is our second or third year doing it, where we have experts from within Power Digital that speak to subjects. So I I spoke on entrepreneurship, for example, and then we bring in external speakers. So uh, we brought in Dylan Whitman, for example, I know, I think you've had on the show, to talk about entrepreneurship. So I did the first module, and then Dylan did the second. And they get to hear from both of us and kind of different perspectives and backgrounds. And so we do that for a bunch of subjects. It costs nothing. Um, The team members, you know, they do this before work. It's totally optional and uh, just really, really neat to see how inspiring it is to them and motivating. And so I think in simple, uh, you know, terms, it's treating people the way that you'd want to be treated, showing them how they fit into the bigger vision and how they're not just a spoke in the wheel making sure that you're coaching them up and helping them have the experiences and learnings that they want and that they're drawn towards and uh, just getting to know them on a personal level. And I don't think that any of this stuff needs to be super expensive. I think that most entrepreneurs are very resourceful and you'd be surprised. People love to come talk to our team on these different subjects because you've got hundreds of really inspired, energetic people. And it's uh, 
an hour of your, of someone's time that's invested to talk to our team. And, you know, I'd argue that they get more out of it than our team does at times. And so I think it's just, you know, getting scrappy, asking for the order in terms of who can help you. And I know that I always take calls with young entrepreneurs and try to be a resource. And it, it almost always comes around. And I usually learn quite a bit in those encounters and oftentimes build great relationships. And so I think that's very true. And a lot of companies just kind of lose sight of common sense when it comes to teams. Love this. I, I took, I, I'm scrambling down a ton of notes here as as we're recording today. I, I love the vital five. I think understanding your earning goals, understanding your vision statement and one or two skills that you want to master this year, I think is amazing. Uh, your big personal goal for the year and then how can leadership help you get that goal or goals that you're trying to achieve. I think these are like these are phenomenal uh, that they're documented and you're following through. I also love the Power Digital MBA. I'm going to put a note in for those that obviously that don't work for Power Digital, don't get access to this sort of amazing content. There was a great book that I read and I listened to uh, the audio book. I think there's a 10th anniversary one just came out uh, from a fellow by the name of Josh Kaufman. He has a book out called The Personal MBA. And it is a phenomenal book. I think there's almost a million copies were sold around the world. It really is a world-class kind of business education in one book. I find the online, actually listening to him read the book, and it does break down a lot of the skill sets, things that you're talking about, becoming a business consultant or a trusted advisor, but having a reasonable grasp of all parts of what it means to be a business professional. So they go through a live in there. So I'm going to make sure in the show notes it's there, but it's personalmba.com com is where you want to go to check out that book. Now, this show um, has a diverse range of entrepreneurs. I'm sure you can appreciate there's you know, I don't know, 10 or 12,000 people download the show each month. And from your vantage point, are you able to maybe offer more advice? You've given a ton of advice already, but just more specific advice as it relates maybe to Shopify brands. You know, I have some that are in the early stages, but I have some in the growth stage. And there's some listening today that would be on maybe on Shopify Plus that are in the scale phase. So maybe you can figure out how you want to massage this kind of question into just some good practical advice from what you've seen? I mean, first and foremost, surround yourself with your peers or people that have been more successful with, than you have at that stage. And so for me, that's been incredibly valuable. And I think I've avoided a lot of pitfalls. And also it's drawn me towards a lot of wins. And uh, two groups that have been great for me in that have been the entrepreneur organization, EO, and the Young Presidents Organization, YPO, but there's peer groups for industries. I think there's a lot of value to that. And I believe in that concept, surround yourself with racehorses, you're going to be a racehorse. Surround yourself with donkeys, you're going to be a donkey. I think the other thing for e-commerce is I feel like a lot of companies, and one thing that drives me crazy sometimes, because this is something that we, we can't impact as much, but product development and customer acquisition and marketing need to live in unison. And I think that they're really siloed. And so as you're working on your product roadmap and iterating there, you know, I think really working backwards and saying, what does the customer data tell me? What do my customers want that I have today? How can I test this and see whether what they'd be willing to pay for this and if the economics work out? You know, I think there's a gold mine there and your list is one of your biggest assets and we're talking about first party data, that's what that is. And so to me, that's a really win easy winning formula. If you can start to get more value out of your current customers, you know, the acquisition price is so low because it's sending an email or a text or whatever that is. So I would really look hard at that and try to focus on that. Another is just simplifying your business. I've made this mistake so many times, but having really simple metrics. So like within my business, it's new business is pillar. We have a four pillar system. Every employee in our company would be able to articulate this to you. And we keep score weekly, monthly, quarterly. And the first pillar is new business. And we've got very specific goals. And then we've got an executive that owns that metric is held accountable to it. So there's very clear accountability. And then we it's broken up to get there across a bunch of team members that have sub goals. And then we've got service expansion. So that same customer, different product, very important metric to us. It's the most scalable type of revenue that we can get because it's far less burden on the engine, the growth engine, than adding a new customer. And same thing, we've got clear ownership for it. We've got really clear about eight years of data that show the more services that we're doing for a customer, the better the results they get. 
the longer they stay with us and the more profitable it is for us. So that's a pillar for us. And then the third is retention. So client retention or the inverse of churn. And then the fourth is efficiency. And we use a really simple metric around efficiency to assure that we're getting the margins that we want. The umbrella metric is uh, profit per production employee. So, you know, I would think about that within your own companies is like the three things that drive your economic engine within your, your business. Does everybody in your company know them? Are you keeping score? Because what you measure tends to improve. Do you have clear owners? Are those owners capable of owning that metric and hitting that target? But how do you really make it the bigger goal that you're working towards or the bigger vision that you have, you know, more digestible and simpler for everybody to execute against? That's another one. The last one I'd say is just premium talent is worth it. Really early on, I was cheap and I'm probably cheap in general. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs are, but, you know, it's been eye opening to me how easily you can get a return on that expensive team member or executive or a partner. And so any investment we're going to make, we've got a simple one pager and there's a, what is your ROI case against this investment? And we focus more on the ROI than the investment, because if there's a clear ROI against it, then it could be a great investment, even if it's you know super expensive. And it took me a long time to learn that and figure that out. And I think that uh, life could have been a lot easier. And some of the sacrifices that I had to make personally and that our team had to make could have been avoided. Like balance was one of them. I mean, I lacked balance in my life for many years. I didn't probably achieve it until a couple of years ago because of this. And so I would start looking at, you know, talent and those costs and looking at the flip side, which is what is the ROI? How confident are you in that ROI? And using that to really make those decisions. So those would be some of the things that I've kind of learned over the years and definitely made uh, plenty of mistakes that I can share that uh, now have become, I think, assets towards our growth when they were probably more anchors in the past. Thank you for sharing that. I just, I really appreciate it. So I think that's what entrepreneurship is all about. It really is paying it forward. Failures are only failures if you choose to quit. And so it sounds like what's happened through your career is that there hasn't really been any failures. I mean, there's some, been some projects that haven't worked out as planned, but picking up the pieces and learning from it just makes you a better entrepreneur in general. So thank you once again for sharing that. Really appreciate it. So what does the future look like for Power Digital? I understand your mission and I understand your pillar understand the uh, the employee growth side of it and so it's, it's interesting to me how, how this engine all works for power digital but let's talk about i guess the remainder of 21 and beyond or just end of the day how do you believe you're going to continue to offer value and assistance to shopify brands yeah so we're on a mission to be the most valued and respected performance uh, marketing agency in the world you know we're well on that journey and there's some great companies that we're competing against for that crown i guess but really what it comes down to for us is just empowering the young people. This industry, especially digital marketing, is a young person's game in a lot of ways in terms of innovation. They can see the trends. I mean, at my age, I'm, I'm 35 now, and I feel like I don't see the trends like I did even years ago. And so we need to create a really safe place for the youngest and brightest to come in and innovate and help us continue to evolve and identify new channels and where the puck is going and have them surrounded by veterans that can help them execute against that. We need to continue to foster a culture where people are not afraid of failure and are willing to test and try stuff to drive innovation. We want to continue to be even more selective with the brands that we work with. And for us, it's never been about the big logo of the brand as much as you know, core values match. So is this a brand that treats their people and their partners the same way that we do? Is this a brand that's poised for explosive growth that we can help them realize and are their goals doable? Because our formula for growth has always been around aligning ourselves with great brands, helping them hit their goals and growing with them. And so those are really where the focuses are and just continuing to be aggressive on recruiting great talent and developing that talent and taking care of them. And you know, one of the really exciting things and that's unique about us is that, you know, we're a tech enabled service business. I, I don't know any agencies that really have that type of technology. And the biggest technology asset we have is called Nova. 
And one of the beautiful things about Nova is that it can connect to a brand's first party data and it will go and analyze and give you a score on every customer acquisition channel based on your economics and your data. And it uses uh, quantitative data analysis through the engine itself. And then we have a team of analysts that are doing the qualitative side, things like you know, creative, which is a little harder for us to quantitatively score currently. And so it gives you a report card uh, through this appraisal process on the gaps in your strategy. And it also gives each channel a viability score and it forecasts growth. So we do a lot of these for professional investment firms, private equity, growth equity, VC, and they hire us to do these. But more importantly, we run these so that we can pick winners and brands that we want to work with because we're very confident we can blow their numbers out of the water and grow them. And when we do that, we become that partner that gets to grow together. So really for us, it's you know attracting more of the right brands, being very disciplined and not, you know, budging on what Nova tells us and really going with the winners and being willing to turn away the brands that are unrealistic in terms of what they think they can do. And when the data is telling us otherwise, to just continue to focus on progress and getting better. And what's exciting, I think, for me as an entrepreneur and as CEO is, you know, we've had a lot of success, but we have so much room for improvement and so many things that we can get way better at. And I think that'll really always be the case. And I think anytime in your business that you think that you, you know, kind of have it figured out that you're in big trouble and you probably reach the peak of where you're going to go and there's nowhere but down that you can go from there. So that's really what's exciting. And one of the great things is we've got a big chunk of team members at Power Digital that have, you know, equity in our company and are really vested in our growth and our mission as we continue to do so. And head towards that path of being the most valued and respected private agency, it's going to be a huge group win and it's going to help a lot of people do something that they never thought was possible. And so that's super motivating to me and exciting and something that really keeps me me going and, and super energized about what we're doing. I love it. So let's talk about some offers that are available today. You talked a little bit already about uh, your acquisition of DataQ. I'll put the link to that podcast and uh, the offer. I guess you mentioned it was going to be one year access to that first party data. So let's talk about that. And if there's anything else that you want to share, uh, just kind of more in closing about any kind of offers. Yeah. So first of all, I would love to connect with uh, any entrepreneurs that want to chat. Hit me up on LinkedIn, uh, Grace and LaFriends and uh, love meeting more uh, amazing entrepreneurs. And then offer-wise, I would love to give any of you access to DataQ uh, free for a year. uh, You can just search it in the uh, App Store. The code is Fastlane, one word. So uh, check it out. It is going to make life easy. It's going to slice and dice your lists. It's going to give you a bunch of actionable insights. We'd be happy to uh, have one of our analysts kind of help show you some of those insights and what to do and what we do with them. We use this tool ourselves. So do a lot of the top agencies in the space. So it's really powerful. We also are willing to offer a few uh, free Nova appraisals. And to give you context, we usually charge 20 to 50 K when we're just doing those one off. We would be open to evaluating doing some of those for free for some of the audience. So just hit me up about that and I uh, can get you in touch with uh, the Nova analyst to, uh, look at doing that process. Yeah, would love to be a resource for any of you and and help in any way. Definitely have uh, seen a lot of brands have a lot of success and have seen a lot of brands that haven't quite had the success that they want and have uh, learned a lot along that journey. And so happy to share those with anybody interested. Thank you for offering those five free Nova audits. I have a couple brands uh, that are in the middle of getting these audits done right now. And I actually got a a copy of a prior one done. And it's a pretty significant piece of content. Uh, No wonder you charge the money that you do, you know, for private equity and VC kind of companies, because this was this one document that I'm looking at right now is 65 pages long of the appraisal and the channel breakdown and really what the analyst score is based on 
all the parts of the funnel from top, middle, and bottom. So top of funnel acquisition uh, to conversion to uh, retention strategies and then all parts. And so it's interesting how you are able to think about content and thinking about paid social and paid search and email and conversion optimization. There's a lot of things in here. And the reason why I had brands do this audit and why I think it's very powerful that you have uh, a software tool plus the human capital to analyze it all and to, and to create this kind of document because one brand made a comment to me specifically and said, you know what, we are doing quite well. We know we're doing well. However, we believe it makes sense to have a third party have a look to see what we're doing and you can't see the forest for the trees. There's, you, just, you just don't know what you don't know. And so that's why they're extreme. So one brand is very excited right now to get access to this audit and then say, yes, you're right guys, you're doing all of these things over here really well, but we see some gaps over here. Oh, and by the way, Power Digital has an opportunity to help you with that particular area. Once again, channel expertise. It really does open the kimono of all things marketing strategy and going, okay, based on this, thank you. Continue going down this journey, but we believe these sort of things you might want to work on. So pretty exciting kind of what this audit can do. For sure. Yeah, to your point, worst case scenario, you're going to get validation that you've got it dialed and that you're doing everything right. And But typically what happens is there's some really easy, low-hanging fruit that you can act against yourself right away and get better results. And, and oftentimes there's some uh, channels or uh, initiatives that are worth exploring based on the data. And there's some really cool emerging channels for sure. I mean, Amazon DSP is a great example it is really going to change the game when it comes to prospecting top of funnel brand awareness uh, through display and connected TV. And, uh, you know, I think we're one of uh, a handful of agencies that have access to that. And so we can run the numbers on that and forecast that channel. And some of those things are interesting for brands that have kind of maxed out in certain areas and maybe are incredibly uh, effective in those areas and don't need help but are trying to find that next thing that's gonna give them more scale. So it, it does all of that and uh, confident that it would be very valuable exercise for any of the uh, store owners that are listening. Yeah, love it, love it, love it. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, all the details will be in the show notes for today for the Data Q one year offer and how you can uh, get access to getting a Nova audit done. I just wanted to thank you, uh, for, you know, for number one for coming on the show today. I know your time is very precious. It's just clear to me that you know that both you and the Power and Digital team really are in tight alignment, uh, you know, based on this recording. I just so proud that, you know, that we're aligning ourselves uh, by wanting to help brands. We're just, there's, there's some commonality here, but wanting to help and contribute to other people's growth. And I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, I wanted to thank you for sharing all your knowledge today. I know your, your brand just releases an amazing amount of content. I syndicate a lot of your blog posts. So there's a lot of thought leader pieces, a lot of vision, a lot of giving back to the Shopify ecosystem. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Yeah, I appreciate it, Steve. Thanks for having me on. I love your podcast and it's uh, an honor and super fun to get a chat with you. So appreciate it. All right. Have yourself a great day. You too. This episode is brought to you by Yachtpo SMS Bump, the leading SMS marketing solution for e-commerce brands looking to build a top revenue channel. Built for compliance, SMS Bump helps you recover carts, launch targeted campaigns, and engage in truly conversational commerce. Join over 90,000 businesses that use SMS Bump to build meaningful relationships with their customers and sell online. So check them out today. Click the link in the show notes, visit the Shopify app store or ecommercefastlane.com forward slash SMS Bump and see why over 90,000 other brands choose SMS Bump. Well, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank you personally for being a loyal listener of e-commerce Fastlane. It's my hope that this podcast is offering you a ton of value through growth strategies, tactics, and exclusive insider tips on the best Shopify apps and marketing platforms, all with my personal goal to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Thanks for investing some time today and listening to the show. I'm so proud and excited that you have a growth mindset and are a constant learner. I truly appreciate you and your entrepreneurial journey. Enjoy the rest of the week and keep thriving with Shopify.